And Lord, we release in Jesus' name this people that we may hear, that we may receive, that we may enter into that which you're speaking and that which you're doing in this day. Truly, Lord, that we may become a people of the kingdom, of the spirit, of that which you're saying and doing. And Lord, this evening I ask in that name that you will quicken us together, that you will cause us to rise up in heavenly places. Lord, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that truly we may know the hope of this calling wherein thou hast called us. Lord, that we may truly become involved in your purpose, in your will, in that which you're speaking, in that which you're doing. Now, Lord, we hold every family before you that's represented in this fellowship, every burden, every need, every person, present or absent. And, Lord, we ask, hallelujah, for that working of your Spirit, that healing virtue for those that need healing this night, Lord. For our brother Jay, for the Lord, for the poison ivy. Lord, in that which you're doing, that for a healing and a working, Lord, we're asking in a very special way for that apprehending of your will for every family in whatever level of need or burden or situation or circumstance. Move within every family, Lord, and work that release for your purpose and for your glory. Now, Lord, quicken us together and cause us to hear the word, to receive that which you would speak. And Lord, in it and through it, we give you the glory. And Lord, we ask, now that we may hear, truly, Lord, that we may have anointed ears to hear, an understanding heart to receive, a prophetic tongue to speak forth the word of the kingdom. We thank you. Now, Lord, in all this, we give you the glory. We acknowledge you that Jesus and he alone may be seen and worshiped in Jesus' name, both now and forever. Amen and amen. Amen, and you may be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For sort of a launching pad, Judges, right after Deuteronomy, then Judges, Joshua, Judges 2, chapter 2 and verse 10. Amen. Judges, chapter 2, and verse 10. This is just after the death of Joshua. Joshua that had met the Lord, that knew the Lord experientially, that had had faith within his heart and within his life, and had responded in faith to what the Lord was doing. And he had passed off the scene. Then verse 10, it was a commentary on the day that, that, that was faced then, and in many ways is faced again today. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. That is, the generation that heard about the supernatural, the workings of the Spirit, the power of God, the visitation of God. They heard about it. They heard that it happened in this church and that church that it happened in the meeting that they had missed, that it happened in some way when they weren't present and they heard about it and they knew that God had moved or blessed but only in the sense that they were hearing about it. They had not experienced it. The scripture says that the generation that only heard about the supernatural, the, gener the, the, the generation that was satisfied with hearing about the supernatural, failed God. They didn't enter in, and they turned aside and worshipped that which was less than God himself, because they had not personally experienced God. And in our day, all of us, myself included, desperately need the visitation of God, the Lord coming forth and moving personally, not where we can see the Lord move in somebody else's life, but the Lord moving within our life. Now, within each one of us, unless you're different than me, unless you're quite different, within each one of us is a reason why the Lord can move in everybody else's life but our life. Why we can't believe the Lord for the Lord to move within our life personally. 
because we don't pray enough. We don't really seek the Lord enough, but next week, tomorrow, next month, we're going to pray more. We're going to read our Bible more. We're going to seek the Lord more. We're going to come to the fellowship more. We're going to clear away the problems that are hindering. Then the Lord can meet us. And of course, by the time we get that done, we'll have another reason that you had a week or a month or a day in front of us. And somehow the enemy keeps us in some kind of a futuristic vein when we know that we're going to meet the Lord, but that we're not quite ready. And we can't meet the Lord right now because there's something that has to happen first. And then we can meet the Lord. And somehow it's just pushed ahead. You know, it's sort of like you can take a cat and carefully tie a little stick out over its head and hang a nice piece of fish there. And the word is tantalized. It can reach and reach out and struggle, but it just can never quite get a hold of it, no matter what it does. It's just beyond its reach. It's there, but it just can't get at it. And it really wants it, but it just can't make it. It's just, it, it's tantalized. Now, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things to them that love him? And, and, and we do. We love the Lord. We desire the Lord. And yet we have this self-imposed limitation that somehow we're just not quite good enough. We're not worthy. We're not capable. We're not talented enough. We don't have the ability. Everybody else does, but we don't. Now, we're going to work away at that just a little bit. Sort of indirectly, but we're going to work away at it. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, this was Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. A profound verse. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship. That means that we are the product. He's the workman. That the Lord chose us, we didn't choose him, he chose us. We are his workmanship. And since we are his workmanship, the Lord has a destined point that he desires to bring us to. We are his workmanship, we're the product, the activity is on his part. We are the recipient of the activity of the Lord. We are his workmanship, we, you, I, we, all of us, each and every one of us that's here. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That good works means that the Lord has a purpose. And if we go back to Romans and 8, the scripture tells us that we've been predestinated to be made conformable to his image and likeness. And another verse tells us that all things work together for good. Not all things are good, but all things work together for good. Now what is that good? The good is his image and his likeness wrought within our lives. See, all things. We are predestinated. That is, before the foundations of the world, the Lord determined to draw us to himself. Because the Lord is drawing us to himself, we're here tonight. Regardless of our attitude, regardless of how spiritual or how carnal, how indifferent, we're here because somehow the Lord got us here. We're here. We're his workmanship, and he's working on us in varying degrees of of interest or capacity or ability. The Lord is working on us. We are his workmanship. Created unto good works. What are the good works? The good works are the circumstances that we face in everyday life that provoke us towards God. See, all things work together for good. Not all things are good, but all things work together to produce good. What is the good? G-O-O-D is an Anglo-Saxon word that comes from another root. The root word would be G-O-D, God, God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God, God the Father, God. Good means like God, similar, of the same nature, good, I'm good, you're good. That means I'm like God. If you're good, you're like God. That's what that word means, good. All things work together for good. What good? To produce his image and his likeness within, to bring forth his image. He predestinated us for that purpose. That is, his purpose has nothing to do with my feelings, with my, in brackets, spirituality. 
with my desire towards seeking him where I'm trying to break through some kind of a paper wall to reach the Lord and I can't seem to find him. It has nothing to do with that. The activity of God is towards us in reaching us. And sometimes we're so busy trying to be spiritual and struggling towards God that we stir up so much dust that we don't realize how close the Lord really is because we're not quiet enough to respond to his presence and get in tune with what he's saying and what he's doing because we are his workmanship. He's the workman. We're the product. The activity is on his part. He chose us when we were unlovely. He chose us. He predestinated us before we were born. He set his purpose. He drew us to himself. That's why we're here. The Lord sovereignly drew us together because he has a purpose. He's working his purpose within our lives. We are created unto good works, which God hath, in Ephesians 2.10, which God hath before ordained. Now that means before the foundation of the world, the Lord knew the circumstance that you're in. The circumstance that you're in is different than the one that I'm in. Our circumstances vary, but the circumstance that you are in is not an accident. It's not an accident, but the Lord sovereignly chose that circumstance to allow that circumstance to work upon you to produce his image and his likeness within your life, to create a set of circumstances that would provoke something. And we may not understand it, and we may not like it, and we may react against it, but we're kicking, as, 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 as Saul of Tarsus, we're kicking against the pricks. And if we would relax and rest, then the Lord could break through and bring a revelation or a word to us. Now we're going to take a look for a moment at the life of David. David was chosen by the Lord in a profound way. We go back to, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, for just a moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, this has to do with, with Samuel, who was perhaps the greatest prophet that ever lived was told that he was to go to the house of Jesse and ordain one of the sons of Jesse. Jesse had eight sons. Seven of the sons responded and understood this. They went and bought a brand new suit, took a shower, had their hair styled, bought the, the most expensive aftershave lotion, went to all the weightlifting classes. You know, they did everything and they all arrived, brand new shiny shoes, patent leather shoes, all shined, and they showed up and stood before Samuel. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 6, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 6, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord, verse 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now there is a principle that is absolutely profound. And the principle simply stated in language that we can understand is this. The Lord chooses us according to the potential, to the desire of the heart that's within, and not the outward circumstances that we face or are involved in at the present moment of time. The circumstances that we're in at the present moment of time may absolutely cause the rejection of the Lord, but the Lord looks at an inner potential within a person's heart or life, and if that potential is towards the Lord, then the Lord will choose that one. And so verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadad, and again and again, then verse 11, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There yet remaineth, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Here's this one now, a little lad, out keeping sheep. Psalm 78 and verse 71 for just a moment. This is absolutely profound. Psalm 78. These others were there 
with the most expensive aftershave lotion. They showered themselves, polished themselves, had, had even had their toenails manicured. I mean, they were so careful, and yet the Lord looked at the heart, and he rejected them. Psalm 78. Here's this little fellow. Psalm 78 and verse 70. He chose David. See, it has nothing to do with the individual. There was something within David, and in a moment I'll show you what it is, because it's within the, the pages of Scripture, as to why he chose David. Concerning the others, the Lord said this, He looked not on the outward appearance, not that which seemed to be religious or spiritual, but he looked at the heart intention. That is, it's within each one of us to will or to choose towards the Lord. We have that ability within us to choose. We may not have the strength to overcome in our circumstances and fulfill all that the Lord is saying, but we have within us the ability to will or to desire towards the Lord. And if we're willing or desiring towards the Lord, the Lord is going to see that and respond and do some choosing towards us. See, the choosing is on the part of the Lord. The enabling is from the Lord. The anointing is from the Lord. The quickening power is from the Lord. Our part is but to respond. Verse 70, he chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfold. While the other were all there, absolutely immaculate, standing before the greatest prophet that ever lived. Here's this little fella out in the barn, all smelly, <laughs> with his clothes dirty. See, from following the ewes great with young, that means a mother sheep had just given birth. And he was so concerned for the birthing of a little lamb that instead of being there for the anointing of a king to follow in the footsteps or, or, or to take Saul's place, instead he was so concerned over the birthing of a lamb that he stayed back in the sheepfold and he saw to the birthing of that lamb. There's something within the heart of God that's concerned with the birthing process to bring forth within the birthing with, of the potential within a life, the potential, the, the birthing of new sheep of the potential of a life springing out of its circumstances or whatever it may be, but a birthing process from one dimension, realm, into another. And here's David choosing that birthing process, the birthing of, 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 of a little lamb over being in the place where the prophetic anointing was flowing. But the Lord saw that choosing. He saw it. From following the use great with the young, he brought him to feed Jacob. See, he was feeding the sheep. Now he was lifted to do the same thing, to feed Israel from one dimension to a higher dimension in the same way because he was faithful in the lesser thing, in the mundane thing, in the earthly thing, because there was a faithfulness in the place where no one saw but the Lord himself. For it was the Lord that said to Jesse, Jesse, don't you have any more sons? He says, oh, there's just this little one, but he don't amount to anything. He, he's out there. You know, nobody can see him. The Lord saw. And the Lord called the attention of Samuel to the fact that there was another one. The eighth, speaking of a new beginning, of something new that the Lord was going to do and accomplish in the earth. Je uh, uh, David was the eighth son, and the Lord was going to bring forth something tremendous through David, the eighth son. So he fed them according to what? The integrity. Where did the integrity come from? When he was all alone, where no one could see. Where no one could see, you see. But because when we come to that place that we recognize that the Lord sees and understands and knows the heart, our choices, our decisions, what we do, when no one else knows, but when we choose the Lord in that place, and we solemnly choose the Lord when it's within us to choose the Lord. You see, that's the thing. In that place when we're all alone, we say, well, no one sees, no one cares. But when we recognize that the Lord sees and we choose the Lord in that barren place, in that lesser place, in the lesser realm, where there's a faithfulness where we really don't need to be faithful, when it would seem that there's no reason for being faithful, when we're faithful in that place, then the Lord will accomplish his will. Now, what was it? 
He fed them according to the integrity of his heart. Where did that integrity come from? It was wrought within his life through being faithful towards the task that was given by his father Jesse, the lesser realm, the lesser place. And he was faithful in that place. And the Lord chose him. The Lord moved upon him and within him. Now, Psalm 27, for just a moment. Again, see, the Lord chooses according to the inner desire. Now, that inner desire manifests itself under pressure. Not in church, not at the altar. I'll give you an example of this. One time, this was a good many years ago, a long time ago at Pinecrest, a young man came, gave a tremendous word on the cost of following the Lord. It was, term- it was heavily anointed, beautifully anointed. He gave a message on the cost of following the Lord. When he finished, the anointing lifted. I mean, it lifted and it seemed like a wet blanket settled over that place. It was almost like it was like a pushy thing. And then he said this. He said, there are those that, that are here that should choose, that should make a choice to follow the Lord. Is there anyone here that would really choose to make that choice? There was no anointing, absolutely none, no feeling, no nothing. Finally, after he repeated it a couple times, one fellow came up. Then finally, after a struggle, one more came. Then a couple minutes later, all at once manifest glory hit that place. I mean, the glory cloud settled, the glory of God hit that place. Everybody jumped to their feet and began to rush up front, and, and a word of the Lord came, and the Lord said, you're too late. You missed it. You missed it. You see, in the glory, in the place of visitation at the altar, when the Lord's moving, everybody will follow the Lord. Hallelujah. When the glory of the Lord is poured out in the day of visitation, every knee will bow, every tongue will proclaim, everybody will follow the Lord. But, but the reward for it, there isn't any. There isn't any. There's worship, but there's no reward. There's no reward. It's too late. The reward comes right now. In choosing, when there's every reason not to choose, when it's easier to choose something different, you see, in the place of affliction. We are his workmanship created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. These good works are what? They're an atmosphere, an attitude, a circumstance, a situation. The very situation that perhaps you're in right now, where you're struggling and saying that I could be spiritual if I could be somewhere else. I could be spiritual if I could be somebody else. I could be spiritual if I was in a different set of circumstances. Then I could be spiritual. And the Lord is saying that you're to make a choice and a decision towards him right in the situation that you're in. You're to choose right where you are in the situation you're in. You see, from being faithful, following the you great with young, out in that place, not in the, in, in, in the limelight, with Samuel, the greatest prophet that ever lived, right in the greatest meeting that perhaps was ever held, to choose David, the beginning of the lineage, the kingdom lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest meeting that perhaps was ever held. And here's little David out in the sheepfolds, more concerned with a, with, with a sheep that's going to give birth. And there was something within his heart towards that birthing that the Lord saw a potential or a situation. And the Lord ordained David was brought forth and Samuel poured the horn of oil on his head. And the prophetic word of the Lord came and he was ordained to be king over Israel. So David got a hold of a good secretary and he, and, and he had his prophecy typewritten. And he put it in the flyleaf of his Bible. You know, that he was to be king over Israel, and he had it in his Bible. And somehow Saul got a hold, got, got a hold of his prophecy and read it. <laughs> and he became very upset because he realized that his days were numbered. And so the day came when Saul hurled the javelin at David, and David fled for his life. And Saul got his army together and went after him. And here's David, Psalm 27 and verse 1. And here's David hiding in the back of a cave, in the back of a cave where it's so dark he can't even read his prophecy (laughs) because it's too dark. He dares not even light a light to read his prophecy. From the greatest prophet that ever lived, 
And it's too dark to even read his prophecy. Why? Because Saul and his army are outside trying to find him to kill him. And all at once, David realized that there was something greater than the prophecy that he had from the greatest prophet that ever lived. And he began to sing from the depth of his being. Now, some of us at that point would say, Lord, here I am. I've got this prophecy, and I'm supposed to be king, and here I am. I'm about to be killed, and I'm in the back of a cave hiding, and I had to flee for my life. Lord, is that the way you treat the people that are called to serve you? If that's the way it is, Lord, I'm going to quit. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to go to a different church. I'm going to do something, you know, I, Lord, I don't have to put up with this. Of course, none of you ever said that. See, none of you ever said that. See, but that's at the point where the Lord is searching out the heart to see where we're really at. To see where we're really at. And here's David at the back of a cave about to lose his life. The light that he had was the fact that he was to be the king of Israel with a prophetic word from the greatest prophet that ever lived. But it's too dark. And all at once, all of that was taken away. There was nothing left but the Lord himself. And David, instead of cursing the Lord, see Job, you'll be here, those of you that go will hear a little bit about this, that the temptation that Job faced to curse the Lord. For the enemy had said to God, Oh, he's just serving you because you've blessed him, because you've given him everything. Because you've given him everything, he's serving you. But if you took everything away, he would curse you. The Lord said, all right, take everything away and we'll see. I don't know if the Lord would ever dare do any of that to any of us, to me especially. See, I, I, I'm not so sure. See, if the Lord would dare. It would be nice if the Lord would dare, see, because we are his workmanship created unto good works that the glory of God can be shown forth in the context of our lives, not in the blessings and all the things that are added to us, but in the fact that we're choosing God when it would be easier to curse God. We're choosing God, that there's something, and that little word that comes into play at that point is called integrity, that there's something called integrity that's burned right within our bones and nothing can touch our relationship. It becomes established to steal. Like Jesus, when the scripture says that he set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem, he knew what was going to happen, and he set his face as a flint towards the very thing that would destroy him, seemingly, in all that he had come to accomplish and do. But it had to come through the cross, and he chose that and set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. And all at once, David, having lost the light of the throne of Israel, began to sing, The Lord is my light. Pitch dark. There's nothing there but David and the bats in the back of a cave. The Lord is my light. All at once, now there was something new. Notice that light comes before salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Saul and his army that are out there? No, no, not at all. See? And all at once, something became to David more important than the throne of Israel, than the promise, the prophecy that he had received. And he, and, and he began to sing a song, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. All at once, that cave, dark, damp, musty cave, just as that little pit, as it were, where that mother you was giving birth to a little lamb, became, as it were, a temple, David giving birth, and the joy of bringing life forth, of seeing life birthed. There was something within David, and all at once, he began to bring forth the very life of God, and he began to sing the song of Zion, the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And then, hallelujah, he began to sing again. One thing have I desired of the Lord. Not the throne. Not the prophecy. Not the prophet. Not the acclaim of men. One thing have I desired. All of his life reduced down to a single thing. Because everything else was gone. There was nothing left but the Lord himself. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell 
in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, the Lord saw that within David. There was something within him that could be cultivated, something that could be brought forth within David. And the Lord saw the potential. He didn't look at the muscular, the six foot two or six foot four, and that muscular and all of the outward show. He didn't look at that because that would have failed. Saul failed. Saul, in the place of pressure, said simply to the prophet, he said, I was afraid of the people. I was afraid of the people. You see, he responded to something less than the word of God in the place of crises. But David was faithful. And in the place of pressure, he began to sing forth the song of Zion. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And he turned towards the Lord. In the Song of Solomon, for just a moment, all you've got to do is find Isaiah and turn towards Genesis, and you'll run into the Song of Solomon. Chapter 1 and verse 9, for just a moment. Chapter 1 and verse 9. If a young man were to say this to a girl that he was courting, she would be insulted. But if I can explain this right, this was a tremendous compliment. Chapter 1 and verse 9. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariot. Now that's a real compliment, <laughs> whether you know it or not. So we'll explain it. You see, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses. But at this particular time, Egypt was the leading kingdom, the monarchy, with great pomp and ceremony. It was the greatest kingdom in the world at that time, with great pageantry and ceremony. Pharaoh had a chariot of solid gold, and when he came forth before the people to parade or to show forth his dignity or his majesty, he came forth in this chariot of gold with a team of horses, that were precisely disciplined, in absolute discipline. These horses so perfectly disciplined that all of the attention was towards the chariot, not towards the horses, but these horses with an absolute disciplined walk brought forth the king in all of his glory. You see, in the chariot of gold, the king was brought forth in his glory because they had been disciplined. And at that time, the agents of Pharaoh went throughout the known world and sought out young colts, totally undisciplined, but young colts, because these were trained agents, and they had an eye, and they saw within these young colts one or another that had a potential, and they purchased that young colt, and they took it back to the stables of Pharaoh, and then began a long, drawn-out training process where the independent will, the self-will of that colt was broken, and that, that, that animal was made subservient to the will of the chariot that the king, the king in his glory would be seen and that horse would be in perfect submission to the whim or the desire of the monarch that was within that chariot. And that, that, that horse became totally disciplined. And through the discipline, when that horse moved in total harmony with the others in the Lord's army, in total submission to the principle of that army and the function of that army, in a total place of submission, that horse was hitched to the chariot of the king and was a part, had a part in bringing forth the king in all of his glory. And I can say this prophetically right now. The Lord today is searching out a people with potential. See, that's the word. Not manifestability, but like young colts, potential. Right now, rebellious, bouncing all around, going in every which direction, but with something that the Lord could see. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses. See, the Lord is seeing the finished product, but he's looking with the eye of one, hallelujah, that has this tremendous foresight to see through, to see the potential, the possibilities. And he's choosing out those, like David, back within the sheepfold. The Lord saw the potential of his heart. And again, the Lord would say, Man chooses by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, the inner intention, the desire. And desire is one thing that's within us. That's ours. That's our throne, the seat of desire where we can desire. 
And what we do with that desire towards life indicates the action that the Lord will take towards us. If our desire is towards him, the Lord sees that, and he chooses accordingly. He chooses because of that desire that's towards him. I have compared thee to a company of horses, a company of horses that is in perfect unity and harmony, finding our place, not trying to stand out like a sore thumb, but fitting in in total harmony and unity within the disciplined army of the Lord to bring forth the king in all of his glory. The Lord's waiting for that. He's waiting that the chariot of the king can come forth in full manifestation. All creation, the scripture says, is groaning for that time. And the Lord is waiting for that disciplined army to bring him forth in his glory. Hallelujah. I have compared thee. Now, in this choosing, we're going to take a look for a moment at Esau and Jacob. There's a beautiful example of this, another one. David, there's several of them. To take time and go through and look back at Moses. The same thing within the life of Moses, in Joseph, and on and on. Of those whose life, lives have been unfolded or revealed within Scripture, you'll find this principle where there was a choosing of the Lord in an adverse circumstance or situation, and, and this person or that person chose the Lord at that time. Now let's take a look. In Genesis chapter 27, let's take a look at Esau. The scripture tells us in Romans, Esau have I hated, but Jacob have I loved. Esau means ruddy. Jacob means deceiver, one that is a deceiver. He said the ruddy one, that is the strong one, the ruddy one have I rejected, but the deceiver have I chosen. You say, well, now why is that? And of course, if you look in a commentary, the commentary will tell you that God is God and he can choose whom he will. And that's true. But there's a reason, because again, this principle applies, that the Lord chooses according to that which we choose we're in the place when we are in the place of pressure. And let's take a look at these two. So we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 27. And in this chapter, Esau looks pretty good. He looks really good. And it came to pass, Genesis chapter 27 and verse 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said, Behold, here am I. That's good. My son, he said, Behold, here am I. So that's good. So that's a, that's a plus sign for Esau. Verse 2, and he said, Behold, now I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and that my soul may bless thee before I die. And so Esau went out to the field to get meat for his father. Now basically, that's all right. Because the scripture says of Jesus one time, when, when his family came and criticized him because he was doing and, and in ministry and caring for people and all, and they, were, they reprimanded Jesus and told him that he should stop and rest and get something to eat. And Jesus simply said, what? My meat is to do the will of my father. So Esau here looks pretty good. My meat is to do the will of my father. And here's Esau doing the will of his father, getting meat for his father. Now let's look at Jacob. Verse 6, or verse 5. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau's son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, Behold, I heard thy father speak to Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, this is Rebekah, according to that which I command thee. Go to the flocks and fetch me from thence two good kids, and I'll make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. 
And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, preadventure, shall feel me, and I shall seem to him. Here's Jacob not even admitting his nature. I shall seem to him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said, Upon me be the curse, my son, only obey my voice. So while Esau is out getting meat for his father, Jacob and his mother have gotten together, and they're cooking up a deception to deceive. And yet the scripture says, Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. Now that really doesn't make a bit of sense, because it seems to be exactly the opposite of the choice that should be made. Were we choosing by the eye, by the mind, by the human, if we were making a human choice? But again, man looks on the outward appearance. On the outward appearance, Esau looks really good. Jacob looks terrible. And obviously, every one of us at this point would vote for Esau. There'd be something wrong with you if you didn't, except that you knew that the Lord had rejected. But let's look at Esau. You see, there's something about Esau. Again, the Lord chooses because we choose. See, the Lord chooses because we have chosen. The Lord chooses one that will choose him in the place of, adver of adversity or under pressure. When we choose the Lord under pressure, see, that's David. David was subjected to intense pressure. And because of the integrity that had been worked within his heart, within the sheepfold, when he had to flee for his life and was hiding in the back of a cave, instead of cursing God, he chose God. That cave became the temple of the Lord, and he began to worship the Lord in the place of adversity. I wish I could learn that lesson. I really wish I could. I'd like to learn that lesson, although I'm not sure that I'd like to learn it. <laughs> See? Because I know what that means. See, if I were to say to you, how many of you would like to be an overcomer? I wouldn't say that because you might put your hand up. And I wouldn't want to be responsible for causing you a lot of trouble. Because if I were to say to you, would you like to be an overcomer? And if you said, oh yes, and you put your hand up and you meant it, then the Lord would have to bring you trouble. Because you don't overcome ice cream cones. <laughs> See, you don't overcome a raise in pay an ice cream cone, a better job, something. You see, you overcome problems, trouble. And so if you really are telling the Lord that you want to be an overcomer, you're asking for trouble. But the problem is the Lord doesn't always dare bring about that situation because instead we begin to curse the Lord. We quit, we get discouraged, we say, if that's the way it is, then I'm quitting because that's not what the prophecy said that I got. But see, but the prophecy goes beyond the testing, the proving, the time of probation, the prophecies on the other side. And the problem with prophecy is this, that we hear what we want to hear and we don't hear the condition. See, we don't hear the condition, we only hear the blessing, but not the condition. And so here's, here's Esau, out hunting for meat for his father, while Jacob is busy cooking up a deception. But there's something within the heart of Esau that the Lord saw that is not apparent externally. Jacob wanted the blessing because that's good. He knew what that meant. That meant that he was going to inherit all of the wealth of his father, the prestige. So certainly on the surface, he would cooperate with his father. But within his heart of hearts, that cooperation was a natural, a human realm, a carnal realm, a realm that only related to prosperity and blessing, and it did not relate to tribulation, trial, to suffering, to fellowship, to the fellowship of the suffering, to communion with the Lord. It didn't relate in that realm. So let's take a look at another passage of Scripture. Back in chapter 25, a couple chapters back, and verse 29. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 29. We'll take a look. And Jacob sawed pottage. Apparently he was a cook. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. 
Therefore was his name called Edom. This is chapter 25 and verse 30. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now the birthright relates to the inheritance that we have in the Lord, the potential, the possibility that that which we are his workmanship created unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That these good works, that, that which the Lord desires, the blessing. quality of ruling and reigning of the potential that's before us of our life that the Lord is seeking to qualify us for for those that rule and reign with the Lord are those that will have qualified for that place thou has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign but there's a reason because there was an overcoming quality that had operated was manifest within that person's life in the place of testing and proving so Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, ber verse 32, and here's the key as to why the Lord rejected Esau. For the Lord knew what was within his heart. Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, that is physically. And what profit shall this birthright? What good is the supernatural when the needs of the physical are not met? Esau chose the physical, the gratification of the physical, over and above the supernatural, the satisfaction of the spirit, the potential, the possibility of the spiritual life. He chose the gratification of the sensual, the carnal, over and above the satisfaction of God. What good shall this birthright do me? He despised the birthright, he rejected the call of God, the purpose of God, and he chose the sensual. He chose the carnal, the fleshly satisfaction at the point of intensity. Not Thus Esau despised his birthright. The Lord saw that within Esau. Therefore, the Lord chose Jacob, who was a deceiver by nature, and the Lord said, I would rather change the nature of a deceiver than choose one that will choose less than me. You see, that will choose less than me. But I'd rather choose one that has problems within their life and is struggling at this point, but in the end will choose me and Hallelujah. choose and choose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That will choose until that one overcomes. Now let's take a look at Jacob. In Genesis chapter 27, we saw that, what happened, I'm going to go back to that for just a moment, Genesis chapter 27 and verse 12. My father pre-adventure will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. And so I won't take time with this, but they went through with the deception and they made these coverings. And so Esau, I'm sorry, a Jake, or Isaac felt and felt this and so he ate of the, of the, food and he blessed Jacob and gave the blessing to Jacob when Esau came back he recognized what had happened and Jacob fled for his life and served with Laban for a number of years and gained his two wives and we're all familiar with the story now in Genesis chapter 32 we're going to take a look at this chapter and again we'll see this principle Verse 17, we'll skip by this, but most of you know the story, you've read it, how, how Jacob served and, and had all of the problems with Laban and how that, that deception was still working within him and he had gained great riches and he left with his two wives. He served seven years for one wife and got the wrong one and he was deceived in return because there's a reaping for sowing. See, we can be forgiven, but there's a reaping. So he served seven years, got the wrong wife. He had to serve another seven years for the one that he loved. And finally, after all that time, with great riches and with that thing of deception still within him, he's ready to go home. So we have Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31. Well, we'll go past that. 32. But um, 
instead of going into, in, into the details. But the Lord came to Laban and, 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 and Esau gathered all of his things together and his wives and he started back towards home. So here's Esau headed toward, or I'm sorry, Jacob headed towards home with his wives. All right, chapter 32 and verse 1. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanian. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak to my lord Esau. The servant Jacob said thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I've sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in his sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. So here's Esau coming with four hundred men towards Jacob. And here's Jacob with all of this riches. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And so being Jacob, he divided the people that was with him, the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So Esau took the wife that he despised and his lesser things and put them in one company and sent them out and said, now, if Esau smites that, I'll take the other one and I can run. I can run and at least, I'll, at least I can save half, the better half. So, so, so he, he schemed and he worked this all out and he sent them out. Now, he, then, then he began to pray. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me. And then verse 23, this is chapter 32, and verse 23. And he took them and sent them over the brook. He sent over all that he had over the brook. So he's on one side, everything he had is sent over in two different companies, separated. So first the one company and then the other company, Esau's coming with 400 armed men coming towards him. And he's got these two companies separated by a space between them over there. And he's left all by himself, uh, all alone on the east side of the brook, all alone under the most intense situation that you could ever imagine. Everything that he had worked 14 years for, the two wives, all of his possessions, Esau with an army, an army of 400 armed men coming towards them, coming towards them. And they're over there in two different companies, and he has figured out the fact that if, he, if the first group is smitten, they're smitten, then he can take the second group and run, and make a run for it. So he's left all alone. Now what happened when he was, verse 24, Genesis chapter 32, and verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in a theophany. The Lord Jesus Christ. There wrestled a man with him till the breaking of the day. And when he, the man that wrestled, the Lord Jesus Christ that wrestled with Jacob, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And he said, this is the Lord, said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. Let me go. Now, the angel wrestled with Jacob all night. The angel said, let me go. If Jacob had been like Esau, when he said, I'm about to die, what good is the birthright? Jacob would have said something like this. Angel, I'm about to lose everything. We'll wrestle tomorrow, next week. We'll go to the next service. <laughs> we'll go to the service tomorrow night. We'll go to the meet. We'll pray tomorrow, next week. But angel, I'm about to lose everything. I've got these two groups over there, and Esau's going to arrive at the first group, and I need to be there to see what he's doing. Angel, excuse me. Excuse me. Angel, I've got to go. I've got to, pro pro I've got to protect all of my earthly possessions. Angel, I'm about to lose everything. Let me go. Let me go. Is that what he did? No, he didn't. He was about to lose everything. 
and so intense that I'm sure the cold sweat ran down him. He knew he was about to lose everything. But he was wrestling with a theophany, with God himself, and he recognized it. He recognized it, and he knew that something had to happen because he had been weakened. Because of that Jacob strength, he could not submit to the power of God. The angel wrestled, and his human strength, his self-strength, his self-will was so strong, the angel couldn't prevail. So through divine intervention, the Lord sovereignly touched the hollow of his thigh and weakened him until he limped. He literally crippled him because he was so strong within his will that he was incapable of yielding to the Lord. And the Lord weakened him. You see, through, through a divine intervention, he was weakened by the Lord that the Lord could overcome within his life. Should he choose for the Lord to overcome? But he had to make the choice. See, he had to make the choice. The Lord weakened him so he could submit. But he had to make that choice. And so at this critical point, the angel said, let me go. The Lord said, let me go. This is verse 26. And he said, the latter part of verse 26, and Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. You see, Esau ch chose the pottage. He chose the, the bowl of soup. Jacob chose the blessing of the Lord under intense pressure. Under intense pressure, Jacob, I'm sorry, Esau said, what good is the birthright? I'm about to die. Jacob said, I'm about to lose everything, but I'd rather have the blessing of God. You see the difference? There's a vast difference. It's not arbitrary. It was not an arbitrary choice. The Lord knew the heart. He knew what was, he knew that Jacob, in spite of the strength of his human nature, would choose the Lord in the place of adversity, in the place of pressure. Jacob chose the Lord. I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, I am a deceiver. That's what that means. He said, I, I am a deceiver. And he said, Thy name. And because he confessed his nature, because he chose the blessing of God over all of his possessions, he was willing at this point to lose everything. He knew he was losing everything. He knew that everything was going to be destroyed by Esau and the army that was coming. But he chose the blessing of God. Amen. And so the Lord spoke to him because he chose the Lord. And the Lord said this, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince has thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Power with God and power with men. And there is the secret of an overcoming ministry, one that has truly chosen God experientially, as in the beginning, not choosing because they heard a good sermon, because they heard something about the movings of God and responded to an altar call, but one that faced the Lord in life circumstances head on and chose the Lord himself in that place and in that circumstance. Thou shalt have power with God and with men. Hallelujah. Thou shalt be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince, Jacob was changed into Israel and became an overcomer and, began, and, and one that would rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory. Because he chose rightly. Now, the problem is, for most of us, when we come to that destined point, it's never in a convenient place. It's never at the altar. It's never in a, in, in, in a tremendously anointed church service. It's easy to respond there. But it's out in the circumstance that we face that's known to God. And the Lord knows, see, within the heart there's a choice made. And I could document what I'm saying again and again through experiences that I know where there are those that have chosen the Lord and have had their nature changed and have come through to a place of victory. And in the due time, in the due season, that deceptive nature was changed and that person all at once became a prince with God and with what? With men. Power not only with God, but power with man. We are his workmanship. 
We are his workmanship, created unto good works, which God hath before ordained. See, the Lord knows what's within the heart. So he works accordingly to bring us to that place where we can be tested. He'll arrange a set of circumstances where we can make the choice. Now, the real miracle of God is, perhaps every one of us has been through this quite a few times and we've missed. But the grace of God and the miracle of God is this, that circumstances and situations repeat. Just as the children of Israel missed it in the wilderness and had to circle around and come back the second time, there is yet another opportunity for each and every one of us. And I can say, thus saith the Lord to this, there is a choice that, will, that, each, that is before us wherein we can make that final choice of choosing. And once we've made that choice, and once we've chosen, and it's written down within the book of life, within the annals of God, and it's written, and we have made that choice under the intensity of the circumstances, the pressure that we face, then the Lord will begin to bring forth. He'll begin to hitch us to the chariot of the king, to bring forth the king in all of his glory. You will be a prince, hallelujah, and have power with God and with man, and will bring forth the glory of the Lord glory in this generation and I'm believing the Lord that there are people that will make that choice the right choice the enemy will sell us out as cheap as he can if he can sell us for a bowl of soup he'll do it if it takes something more then he'll he'll, he'll ante up the price to that point but if we've made up our mind that we are going to choose the Lord Jacob had great riches he sent everything that he had and he remained on the east side of the brook all alone and on the east side of the brook where the angel detained him from everything that he had when he knew and everything within him knew that he needed to get over there to protect his possessions he said I'll not let you go until you bless me until you change me I need to be changed Lord change me and he stayed in that place at the cost of losing everything he chose that his nature would be changed and God honored it and changed him and he came through to a place of power Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we can't make that choice tonight. <laughs> it won't work that way. But we can do something. We really can. We can tell the Lord to so work. See, we are his workmanship, created unto good works. We are created towards that destined point. And we can tell the Lord to work within us, to strengthen us, that truly that we want to come to that destined point and at that point make the right choice. We may not realize it at that point and everything within our head would tell us to choose otherwise but there's something within our spirit of that Abba Father deep within our being where the spirit will cause and enable us to make the right choice. Abba Father, that ring of the spirit deep within our lives. There'll be something that's cultivated within that we've tasted of the Lord and that we know that we want the Lord at any price and we're willing to let everything go that we have the Lord if, if that's the choice that we choose the Lord and we can tell the Lord that that's our desire and ask the Lord to work within us towards that point that at that point there'll be the aid of the Holy Spirit within that will enable us strengthen us wherein we can choose see that will not go through it blindly Jacob knew what he was doing he understood he knew what was happening exactly and he made an intelligent choice he allowed the angel of the Lord to cripple him because actually left to himself he would have ran but he couldn't he could have only limped his way because he was weakened the scripture says this who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning on our beloved and the Lord wants to weaken us to that point that he becomes Lord truly Lord where we're not depending on human ability or human strength on that which is the strength of the self-life that ruddy that thing in Esau the strength of the soul that Esau depended on and became Edom and became an enemy of God but the Lord is looking for a people that are willing to be weakened that we might become dependent that we can have this nature this Adamic changed and take on the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ life, the Christ nature, and take that nature upon us and become like him and pay the price, whatever it is, 
whatever it is, that we can be an overcomer, that we can overcome in that point of time when we're going to be faced with making a decision, a critical decision that will mark us for eternity. And by the grace of God, and I can say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord is witnessing to me that what I'm saying is absolutely true. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what choice you've made. I'll say, thus saith the Lord, and I'll stand before the Lord on this. For each and every one of us, without exception, that choice is ahead of us, not behind us. It's ahead of us. We yet face it, and we will and we'll come to that point. The day will come when Esau, with his army, will begin to approach, but then we'll make our choice. We'll make our choice. It's in front of us. It's not behind us. And the Lord is asking for a people, looking for a people that are going to make the right choice in that day. Then he'll mark them and bring them through with a changed nature. We'll be a part in bringing the king forth in all of his glory. All right, let's all stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, somehow, Lord, that you can take this. And Lord, that you can somehow impart into our being, into our lives. Lord, that this is not just the game of church, of attending church, of coming to a nice service. But somehow, Lord, it's a deadly game of life where critical choices that affect eternity are being made. Not so much in an anointed service, but in the arena of life. For, Lord, there's no separation between secular and spiritual. They're all one. And you're working within our lives, bringing forth and causing decisions and choices to be made. And now, Lord, I lift up each and every one here and Lord that that choice and we establish that choice for every life that that choice is yet before us that we may choose life that we may choose hallelujah to bring forth that life our Lord Jesus Christ in the fullness in its full expression Lord that will not choose the easy way but will choose Lord that which pertaineth to your purpose and your will at that point Lord, that we may choose you. Though you wrestle with us, though you have to weaken us. Lord, we're willing for that and we give you permission. Hallelujah, glory. Lord, we give you permission that we may be weakened within our self-life. That truly, Lord, we'll choose that which pertaineth to your eternal purpose. That we may become a part of that which you're saying and that which you're doing in this hour and in this day. Lord, we thank you and Lord, we give you the glory. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.